What's up, folks? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Off the Record. You know Off the Record. We love Off the Record. They have made tickets disappear. They can make a ticket disappear. Only suckers plead guilty to your moving violations. Real geniuses go to Off the Record. They go to offtherecord.com slash TST or use code TST pod in that off the record app. And what off the record does is they will then hire uh, a qualified attorney in the jurisdiction where you got that ticket. They will fight that ticket. They'll do the paperwork. They'll go to court on your behalf if they need to. You don't have to do a thing. And in the vast majority of cases, off the record can get those points off your record, saving you time, saving you money saving you on insurance, and saving you headaches. Getting points on your license can impact your life, your insurance rate, even your job. So go to Off The Record if you get pulled over. Offtherecord.com slash TST or code TSTPOD on that Off The Record app. All right, folks, on this episode of the show, Zach and I are on the porch. We're in South Carolina on my back porch talking about cars. We've got an update on my Bentley. We've got uh, some thoughts about what to do with my disassembled Lamborghini. We talk more in depth about the Aston Martin DB12 Volante and how it fits into the spectrum of luxury GT cars. And boy, do we have a lot of great Patreon questions for you on this one. It's a porch crew show. Welcome to the Smoke and Tire podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to my porch. This is the vacation cast. The porch cast. Porch cast. I feel like other people have done porch casts before. We haven't done very many porch casts. Uh, we haven't, but it doesn't mean we can't copy the other folks. Right. They're onto something. It's so but, nice out here. Yeah, this is great. We're at, uh, we're at my house in South Carolina, and uh, we've had a relaxing couple of days for my wife's birthday for my five-year anniversary yeah brought some people down and now we've sent them all away so we can work which is uh, a metaphor for life we'll <laughs> <laughs> send our loved ones away so we can get things done mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a little a uh, little espresso a little pellegrino a little acid reflux mm-hmm. going and uh yeah I'll yeah cookies but uh what a beautiful day here here in the low country, and uh, we can talk about cars. Of course, before we get into it, got to give a shout out to our patrons. Thank you for getting on that game, um, as well as an apology for missing our pro driver show last month. My travel was insane, and then, as you may have heard, a few other things happened. <laughs> and uh, we will catch up. We will we will make good on those shows. So uh, that's just as good as money. Those are IOUs. <laughs> Right. That's a little right. You're going to want to keep that away. If Lloyd Christmas can pay his debts, so can Matt and Zach. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've got a few things uh, to talk about today. Uh, we're not wearing any of the new merch right now, but uh, we've got new merch in the store. A couple of those items have sold out. Yeah. Get them before they do. We've also submitted our new designs to go into the store. I don't know when that'll happen, but um, the smokingtireshop.com. Or uh, click, go to the smokingtire.com, click on that tab uh, for merch, and that's where you get that's where you get your TST merch. Mm-hmm. Those hoodies that you designed were those are the biggest seller. That's very cool. Someone here stopped me and they said, oh, "That's a cool shirt." Yeah. Said, oh, the guy, the guy yeah. at the gym Mike who was the gym. who was uh, photographing his Acura TL. Yeah. Uh, TL TLX TLX TLX. Yeah, it yeah. had that exhaust when boom. Big cans. The big yeah big, big four inch. Fist of cans. Yeah, yeah, four of them. It's like you see that on a vet. But. That car, if I recall, I tested it at Laguna. Correct. Surprisingly good. Yeah. At everything except downshifts. Uh, it has a slush box, yeah. and the paddle shifters were not that responsive. But the chassis and the speed and the brakes and everything else about else about the car, pretty awesome. Yeah, I drove it on Angeles Crest when they did accurate that that day of like historical vehicles mm-hmm. and modern and i drove the integra type r right and they were like we also have you know our modern sedans and crossover and I was right like, you should have brought those out first yeah so was it i mean after was it was it dull after the integra type r 
Well, the TLX was surprisingly fast. Yeah. And very good in the turns. Yeah. Um, it's a car that flares out. The body flares out almost like the RS6, where mm -hmm. if you stand behind it and look at the cabin, there's like two more feet of car on either side. But uh, it was only a step down because the, the ITR is so angry and loud. Right. It's rowdy. Yeah. It's rowdy. It's, you could you can't say fizzy anymore. People get mad when you say fizzy now because apparently you know Top Gear owns that. Do they actually own the copyright? No, or, of course oh, not. But, but like, James May said it. That was people have said it. They've said it first, and now you can't say it again. You have to come up. It's like, what do you think we are? English? We only have one word for this. It's fizz. Well, we got our whole country from people that left England. So are we just doing? We're continuing that tradition. Yeah. And isn't America about tradition? For better when or worse, it's convenient. Yes, it's better about. It's better. It's America's best when we forget our past and pretend like that's knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of England, we did not talk about the DB12 Volante. Oh yeah, the last did. show. The video yeah. review is up. Um, what a lovely thing! Oh. I mean, Ooh. I think that's the best convertible available right now. For a, sorry, sorry, for okay. expensive GT convertible for two, for two plus two. Yeah. That's right. my favorite. Because there's other cars that have roofless, but they're mid-engine cars. Correct. That I think are... Yeah, like, you know, 720S. I'll take a 750 Spider, sure. all things considered. But if you if you need... It's not really a back seat. If you need a bar, a leather a leather lined parcel shelf with seat belts. Yeah. Uh, if you want your backpack convenient so you can reach snacks or, mm -hmm. or bribe money or whatever right there, it's there. Because the trunk isn't that big. No, it's not. You know? It's not. But I do prefer it to the Bentley GTC. And I'm a huge Bentley GT fan. I am like, I'm a big booster of Bentley GT in general. But the GTC, the convertible, it's got a little chassis jiggle. This had this has almost none. Yeah, yeah, almost none. A lot of those, the, the last cars that have chassis jiggle are 2 plus 2 convertibles. Mm -hmm. Everything else, the mid-engine cars, they've all solved this. The nine eleven, uh, the nine eleven, pretty much mostly has solved it. Mostly, it's probably the best one of the two plus two convertibles. But I wonder, do you think because the belly is all wheel drive? I wonder if the construction of it, like, can, do they not put as much bracing in it because they already have so much weight in it from a more complicated drive system or something? I'm just wondering, like, why? I just why theirs has a I don't more think the than Bentley Volante. GT C buyer. Cares, cares that they don't. much you know like i don't i just i th it's a pretty nitpicky thing like it's not horrible by any means it's just like if you've driven the coupe and then you drive the convertible it's something you can feel yeah you know like it's it doesn't make it bad and it's like if, if most people wouldn't drive one and then the other you know and it, if what you want is a convertible the trade-off is probably worth it. If you want a convertible. Okay, I understand. With 911, the stiffer the car, the more you... The stiffer the suspension, the more you notice it. So like Carrera S convertible was not bad. But then when I drove GTS convertible, which is stiffer, I was like, oh, I can feel a little more of the jiggliness because now the shocks are stiffer mm -hmm. and the rest of the chassis is the same. But DB12... Really, very little, if any, jiggle at all. I think the DB12 is the perfect car for someone who likes to do events like uh, the Smoky 600. Yeah. Or like any of these multi-day driving events where you're doing highway stuff, but then also where, where twisty things are not just um, part of the path to get to where you're going. Like that's part of the plan. Yeah. Like that's, that's part of like intentionally part of the destination is the road itself yeah. because it shines on both of those things. Whereas yeah. I think the Bentley is aimed for someone who leaves the airport, comes to a vacation place, goes to work. They're not really, and they probably have a Porsche or a Ferrari at home and that's their The Bentley is a daily driver. Car. Yeah. It's a daily driver. It, it's special in its construction and its luxuriousness, but you need a coupe that's either like the S or the Speed mm -hmm. if you want that to be your like weekend car. And not just your regular car. And I think even then, because that speed is amazing. Speed we drove awesome. it in a tight canyon. It was shocking. But I, I mm -hmm. agree with you. I think the buyer of it is still someone who's just driving it around town. We see a lot more Bentleys in L.A., at least I do, than we do DB11s. Yeah, yeah, Like yeah. people, I think they don't take them out. They don't run them to work that much compared to Continentals and things. Right. The, 
the uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think that's definitely true. It, there, it is a little more of a volume product for sure. The Astons are even more handmade, and, mm-hmm. and um, but I was just uh, I had I had high hopes for DB12 Volante because the DB12 Coupe was so good, and it really didn't disappoint. I mean, it felt nice and insulated with the top up, very quiet. Um, and then with the top down, it, it really has a beautiful, uh, shape does to it that I don't necessarily think the Bentley has with the top down. The Bentley looks better as a coupe. Yeah. Whereas the Aston maybe looks better as a convertible, actually. I think it's almost even, you know, and, and there's a lot of cars, like you said, where it looks like they just cut the roof off, yeah. which I know that's what they did folks, but where it looks more out of place. Right. It looks more like a consolation prize. The yeah. 350Z, the first one, that was one where I looked at it and went, this looks like someone just took the straightest saw yeah. and cut the roof off, and it's just a straight line from headlight to taillight. Right. Whereas the the Aston, especially with that lower deck lid, right. versus like the Portofino or the California before it that had a really Well, especially if it's a hard retractable butt. hard top. If it's a four-seater with a retractable hard top, then you've really got a big, you got a bustle. big bustle back there. Yeah. But even like... The SL, you know, and the um, and the uh, and the GTC, which have soft tops, it's still a a higher higher bum. Yeah, um, this looked a lot more sleek. Yeah, it was. It's rad. Now, should we? <laughs> we we this this is the thing. You could actually see this happen in real time in the video if some of you folks watch the video. Um, but there's a law in England. You know how, how how cars with start stop technology in in America and maybe globally, um, the car has to default to its most efficient mode every time you start the car. So that means you know normal power and power in normal and all that. Maybe your suspension settings stay because that doesn't affect efficiency. But but the start stop always you have to turn that off every time you drive the car. Mm-hmm. Well, now there's a new law in England that your car has to start in the safest, the most, the max ADAS mode, meaning your lane keep assist is on every time you start the car, which sucks. Because if you don't like lane keep assist, you don't like it always. <laughs> it's yeah. not the kind of thing. It's not conditional. Right. And even though that law hasn't taken effect in the U.S., and we're not sure if, when it will take effect in the U.S., Aston Martin has decided, at least with the press cars that we drove, to be proactive and make that a default. So, so far, they're saying in the U.S. spec cars, it will be default lane keep assist on every time you start the car. The problem with that is, A, that sucks, and B, it's buried in a menu to turn it off. So you don't, you know, start stop almost always has a hard button somewhere pretty convenient up on the dash or near the shifter or something. So you go, okay, dun, 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 off, right? My Porsche, it's right next to the shifter. But um, with this, you got to go, was it three levels into a menu? Yeah, it was pretty deep. It was deep and and it wasn't connected to the individual mode. So you've got your drive mode selector. You've got GT, Sport, Sport Plus, and then you've got your individual where you can set your your parameters however you want. But this lane keep assist thing isn't connected to that. So it's not like you can get in the car, click it once to individual, and now have your start stop is. And start so stop is like you know, with BMWs, like the M mode. When you set your M1 or M2, you can change not only like transmission, brake feel, uh, throttle mapping, but you also can change your traction control system. Yeah. And it's really nice. You can get in and hit if if you're driving a track, you go, I'm gonna go full off M one. Yeah. Oh, it's raining, I have an M two button that's set to half off. Right. It'd be great if they could hide that lane keep stuff in the individual thing. And it'd be awesome if I don't know if they're allowed to do this, but for the US market do an o- over the year update where that function is tethered. You know, yeah. you can set that. I don't know if that car has over the year update capability. Maybe it I does. I assume everything does now. I don't know. I, I assume everything does. But I don't know for sure, mm. and I only really hear um, electric cars ever discussed with over-the-air updates. Mm. I never. I've I've been on some press launches recently for stuff where over-the-air updates aren't really talked about 
But when I go on an EV press launch, it seems like they're talked about all the time. So I don't know if that's intentional. Um, where like a, uh, an EV could sort of turn itself on to do the update, whereas a gas car maybe couldn't, you know? I'm not really sure. Um, but it could definitely be something that's just made a feature because it's just, it's software, right? So they yeah. could they could build that into the into the MMI. Um, and I hope they do because we're talking about a car that's stupidly expensive. Yeah. Starts with a three. And I mean 300. <laughs> it starts with a three. And if you're delivering, it's one thing if the law says you have to do it. I personally disagree with that law. But it's one thing if you're just following the law. But this is the kind of thing where if you're talking about this is a driver's car and it's not only a driver's car, it's a sports car, it's a super powerful car, and it's got to be a luxurious experience, that having to go into a menu every time to turn that thing off, and it's pretty aggressive if it's not turned on. Remember, because we, when we're filming the car, we restarted the car. You know, you park the car, you set up the camera, you start it. So it inadvertently returned itself back on like a bunch of times. It sucks. It's very aggressive. Like, yeah. there, there are times where we were going near the, the double yellow, but not over it. And it was just going, it's quite loud. I will give on a related note, Macan EV, Macan Electric has a stock, like on. A, sorry, a button on the stock they use for cruise control that is to turn lane keep assist on or off. Audi does that also. Nice. And you know what's funny about that button is once you know it's there, it's very convenient. But in many cases, it's hidden behind the rim of the steering wheel. And so you'll be looking. This is a, this is a <laughs> journal, journalist problem. This is not an owner's problem. But you get into a new car, and I'm like flipping out with how do I turn this thing off? It happened the first like three times I drove new Audis, and uh, recently with where they've done this. And then I I'm looking as I'm looking around for buttons on the dash, maybe behind the wheel. I then find it on the end of the of the stock. Yeah. I, I found it by accident because I was looking for the cruise control. Right, right. But right. in that, I went, oh, that little icon, great. Yeah. Because then when I was up in uh, Route Napoleon, it was beeping a little bit because it was also a bit too cautious. It's like right. a helicopter parent, and I needed to turn that off. Yeah, yeah. Having you got you, you either need to have a hard button, or if you're not going to put a hard button, and it, it's probably very difficult for Aston to add a hard button to their interior at yeah. this point, then at least you need to link it to the individual mode. That way, because if you're, if you're, who is the person that wants this thing on all the time and is also using the individual mode? Uh, right. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so, okay, let's, for the people who want to be, I'm a driver and I want my suspension on this and my steering on this, my ESC on sport and my this and this and manuals, one click. And I wonder if there's, if it's part of the law where it has to be. It can't be too easy to disable it. I mean, because otherwise they could put they could put a thumbnail on the home screen. Yeah, put it there. It, you know, next to other things, other functions, or when you go to modes, have it right there. Yeah, I mean, if that's the case, they wouldn't make start stop a hard button, which it is True. in that car. So like, well, but one is safety and one is a mission. Sure. So they may have I don't know they might have different rules. Possible. Yeah, possible. I'm thinking. I'm just they, asking questions. I'm thinking they came up with that law after they designed the everything and they just went you know and just put just put it in there mm. and uh and in england they can just blame the government on it you know and in america being proactive meanwhile they just came out with a story about aston martin you know they called it like he called it like the asshole effect or something like that where they about them not wanting to put too much stuff in touch buttons and not use haptic and not bury things in screens compared to to real buttons. Wait, how does that make you an asshole? Because if you do it too much, you're an asshole. If you add too many things? No, no. If you if you bury all your controls in in behind touch screens and stuff. Meanwhile, they've done that. I've done a lot of it. Yeah. It's not as bad as other cars. It's not as bad as Mercedes. Meanwhile, someone emailed me because we talked about the Mercedes' roof again with the slider thing. Someone like kind of angrily emailed me and said, hey, you know you don't need to do that. Like, Mercedes isn't training you right on using this car. There is a physical button behind that screen 
for the top, like which I've never the tablet. Yeah, what they said, which you have to you oh. have to hold down. But they said there's a physical button there. I've never seen it. I've never been told about it. This is the first time ever hearing of it. Huh. Okay. I mean, we, it is. It is hard. It it's hard for us to get to know the car. I mean, I guess we should just read the manual. Like, but when the cars show up, there is no instruction because it's not. Yeah. It's not a Mercedes rep delivering the car. It's yeah. always a fleet manager, fleet per, someone employed by the fleet manager delivering it. Um, Particularly and, uh, in those Mercedes, it's, it's like hard to. I have to sit there for thirty minutes and like play with stuff and find stuff on my own. Yeah. So if there's a button that's like somewhere, but it's hard to find, like behind a tablet, mm. like I, it's there's a decent chance we might not find it. Yeah, that's weird. Especially if there's like there is a control within the tablet that's like a no, like pretty pretty. It's not it hard appears to find. like the primary. Yeah, yeah, it does because yeah. it's, it's right there, and we go okay. This is how they made it because they don't want they don't want people to accidentally bump the top-down control right. with their thumb while they're trying to aim at their touchpad. Right. So I, I get you need people to have to prove intention, but holding it for the entire time of you know 14 seconds seemed a little bit much. Like, mm-hmm. hold it for two seconds. Mm-hmm. Isn't three at the most. Yeah. Um, the uh, Speaking of uh, luxury cars, just throw this out there. Um, my Bentley will need one. No. Well, just one little one little thing. It's not bad. This is my... I don't, see, I don't want to laugh at you for, like, misfortune, mm. because I, I don't wish that on you. But it's it's funny, because it's a Bentley. Like, it's an old yeah. Bentley. It's going to need stuff. Right. Um, so, right. the other day, we were driving it, and I got, like, a whiff, a little whiff of coolant. Um, and uh, it's not leaking coolant. There's nothing nothing dripping under the ground. Something's dripping somewhere. No. It's not actually. There is a there's a crack about this long, about an inch and a half long, in the top of the coolant expansion tank. Oh, okay. So apparently, this is a known a known problem. When these cars get to be a certain age, it's made of plastic, and it's just it's, you can't can't handle it anymore. Gives up. Every BMW does this. Yeah, yeah. So. so he's, you know, Charlie says not a major problem, right. not super urgent, you know. I mean, it, urgent enough that he ordered a replacement. Well, because if it's a crack at the top, and grant, I'm, I'm literally a, speaking from BMW experience. It is a crack at the top. If you don't change them at around 100,000 miles, mm. the risk is that the crack spreads, and yes. then all of a sudden your coolant goes all over the highway. Right. So that's why you want to replace it, even if it's only, like, weeping right now. Correct. Well, that's what he said. Okay. He said, you want to replace this. We will replace this. But it's not like a park it situation. He said, it's a small crack. It's at the top. That's why I'm smelling it because it's vent- it vents. Oh, it's what? hot yeah. a little bit. It, 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 it steams a little bit. And so, you know, when I... And the car's not running hot. Car's running just fine. And it's not enough where it's dripping. I topped off the, the, the coolant mm-hmm. just to see if it had a leak. When I first smelled it, I was like, huh, I checked it, topped it off. Nothing leaked, but uh, don't know what it costs yet. I didn't ask, need it. Ooh, should It is I just, I mean, it's like, it's this big, it's a plat, you know. Right. It's one of those, like, how much could it possibly be? But I feel like this is like a good over-under game right. because it's a Bentley part. Right. And is it specific to your Bentley or is it something that was used for 15 years on other cars? I think it's all rules and Bentley from this period. Okay. So it was probably, I mean, it was, uh, my guess is this exact part was used for, are you going to look up the part? Yeah, let's look at eBay. 91 Turbo R uh, coolant expansion tank. We'll see, see what we get. I'm, I, he said it takes like 15 minutes to put it on when he, when it comes in. So that's the good news. So I won't, I won't have some big, big Charlie Bill. What are we looking at? Wait, that's stealth. What? No. Oh. I, I typed in Bentley Turbo R, and what you got was Dodge Stealth. What if they? What result. if that's a parts share? Overflow reservoir tank, seventy one dollars. Yeah, yeah. Booyakasha, Wagwan. That's used or that's new? That is uh, from a ninety two Spirit. That's that's used. the same. Yeah, same car. That's used. Okay. Which you know you want. I'll tell you what. But... You don't want to buy a used one. No, because you'll end up in the same <laughs> you situation here now. Fucking problem. Yeah. Yeah. That thing was probably super glued back together, you know. All right, so yeah, you know, so it's so we're not, you know, it, it'll be more, bucks. it'll be more, but we're not looking at thousands of dollars, right? We're sure. looking at a basic, basic thing. <clears throat> we've got, we have about, um, we've we got about fourteen hundred miles on the Bentley since we bought it, 
So pretty good. We're cruising. We're yeah. cruising. I mean, I, I I knew something else would pop itself up because this you know cars don't just go from you know being taken out once a year on Christmas. When did to, you buy that car? A month. Uh, we bought it uh, December twenty seventh, but we didn't actually drive it until the last week in January. You you have. Uh, you and Sarah have about the same amount of mileage on your cars. Oof. She has a brand new Toyota and you have a Bentley. That's kind of cool. I mean, it's like you're keeping pace. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're driving. Yeah. I mean, Hat has been literally has been dailying it. So um, it's uh, it's great. I mean, it, it, is, so it is really, it's really a treat to drive it. It's so nice. Those car bits. The fucking, so deep. They're so thick. You got to take your shoes off, right? I do. I mean, you don't, take have, to, you don't I, have to I, take I your would. shoes off, I but would. like I, I do. When you guys drove to Vegas, oh no, you didn't, you didn't drive that to Vegas. I drove to I drove it to Vegas to see you too. Yeah, she's yeah, off the whole yeah. way. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, squishy, yeah, real squishy, real squishy. <laughs> really nice. like a memory foam mattress. <laughs> yeah. Um. So so okay. So we're probably in for two hundred bucks, couple hundred, couple hundred dollars. He said he said he said he can fix it while we wait. So that's that means it's nice. easy. Yeah, just yeah. Check the pop it off. On. All right, no big deal. But but I got was when I got that that whiff of the coolant. You go, oh boy, yeah. here we go. Charlie's head gasket. Is it supposed to smell like coolant? No, it's not. Sir. No, <laughs> it's not luxurious. I mean, you ever see a car on the highway that all of a sudden accelerates and white smoke just mm-hmm. pours out the back? Oh yeah, that person's been living with that for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 no bueno. Fortunately, this one's an easy one. Yeah, but um. The uh, uh, speaking of my shit, after our you know after our last show, we talked about the, uh, the situation with the Kumtosh and, and Donnie. A lot of people did reach out. Some were just like recommendations. Hey, you should take your car here. Like I, that's not very helpful. Yeah, someone said take it to Bruce Cannabis place. Oh yeah, the most affordable option, Bruce <laughs> Cannabis. Yeah. <laughs> Does he still have Zuckerman's car? I don't know. He's, Which he's car? Zuckerman's Daytona for like so long that you didn't know Zuckerman owned <clears> Daytona. I did not. Yeah, it's had it for like ever. It's like a meme at this point. Yeah. And I love Bruce, but like he's had Zuckerman's car for a really long time. No, we have I have one, two, three, four, five, six, six, possibly seven options of of people who reached out either from the shop directly. Um, or or recommendations from people that I truly trust. Um, three of the options are in LA. Uh, one is in San Diego, and one is in Ohio, and one is in Colorado. Hmm. So, oh, the Colorado guy. I the Colorado guy is the article. one from the Haggerty right. article, right? Yes, and the Ohio guy is the one that Doug sent his car to. Um, and then there's a couple other options from from people. Who I trust, and so it's, you know, th- there's a there's a couple things to it. One is I ha- we were on vacation, so I, I wrote it all down, but I need to make like a spreadsheet kind of because there's a couple factors that that come into play in deciding what to do. One is like the engine needs to be rebuilt, and I may want to do a little bit of of paint work and and body work, maybe. Um, it's like, do I have, I have to decide and I'm going to talk to Tamarian about this. Do, mm-hmm. do I, do I want to keep it as it is, which is about 95% original. The top of the doors have been painted as well as a little portion of the roof. I think, I think at some point in the past, someone opened the doors into a drywall ceiling Ugh. and some bits fell. Some, something like that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but the rest of the paint is original. But there's there's pitting. I mean, there's there's pitting. It's it's been driven. So there's rock chips on the fender flares and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, cars apart. Like it's just you know. So, While you're in there, so we got to figure out the engine needs to be rebuilt, and I may want to do some body work. And then you know, transporting a disassembled car is a real bitch. That's yeah. a real. That's a specialty thing. That's not. The same as putting it on a transporter, right? So the ones in California, you so can, I you could can bring the parts I could bring them. the parts. Yeah. I could rent a box truck. I could use a local flatbed. The same guy, Super Steve, who I used. You know, we could get the car to one of those places versus to send this to Ohio. I mean, what a fucking nightmare! I mean, the guy could be you know the best in the world, but like, oof. Yeah, the odds of something bad happening on that transit are very high. Yeah, but 
I also would like it to go somewhere that ideally they could do everything the car needs in one place. I wouldn't want to send it all somewhere just for them to have to send the engine somewhere else and then send the body somewhere else. You know what I mean? So, yeah. so I got to I gotta go through this list and call every one of these places and say, you know, here's what we need. What can you do in-house? Yeah. Right? Because you want to at least maybe get it back to a rolling chassis status. Like, I'd feel better shipping a car that had the wheels on it that rolled. Yeah. And they could push it on and off like, you know, a, a regular trailer yeah. versus transport this body very carefully. Yeah. That, that is as complicated as I would make it. So if you had a shop that goes that in, in LA or, or sorry, SoCal that can just install the suspension and all the hoses and things, and then you can send engine to some genius and then you can send the body work to someone else if you yeah. have to. Like, I mean, I'm, it's not my car, but that would at least make me feel more comfortable than yeah. the project in boxes entirely. Yeah. No, I don't, I, I'd really like to find one place that would do everything. Now, I know it's hard to find a mechanic that's got a body shop there, mm -hmm. but at the very least, I'd like to send have a place that can do the engine as well as the reassembly to avoid the double shipping thing. Yeah. Or... Well, Tamarian sends his well, engines... Yeah, to a place. Right. So, like, I could just send the engine there myself send the car to whatever shop and then have that place return the engine completed to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So you'll find out you'll, you're that's the discovery. next. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, and again, not in a hurry, but, um, that's sort of like where we're, we do have some options. Um, all of these options seem, uh, realistic. Um, all of them have experience with, with Countach's, um, and, uh, you know, so I, but I, and I also need to like call a couple people that I know that like may have used these shops for other projects and see, and, you know, I have to, I have to do a little more research. Mm -hmm. Um, what about Midas? They do complete auto care. Yeah. It's gonna be a pet boy. You should just call them just for fun. And we can record that. Just just to call a couple and ask, like, hey, here's the situation, man. You know, my 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 dad left me this Countach yeah. in pieces. Guys, got to take a quick break from the action for Auto Tempest. When you're looking for a car, it's smart to cast a wide net and check as many places as possible. And Auto Tempest makes this super easy, bringing together listings from all the top sites online like Cars.com, True Car, eBay Motors, Carvana, and many, many more. So you get them all in one place rather than having to search a bunch of sites separately. I just learned this today because I am in the habit uh, I, I've gotten myself focused on a type of car that I might like to have in my collection. And I spent a lot of time just trying to Google name of car for sale. And boy, do you get a bunch of garbage. You got to dig through so many sites. They're all trying to target you with their SEO. They're not getting you any closer to finding that car. But then you go to Auto Tempest, type in the same criteria, and boom, get a bunch of tabs right up front, bunch of options, exactly the car that you're looking for without any of the fluff or the brouhaha. Auto Tempest even lets you compare that with results from Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist nationwide not just in your local area. Auto Tempest has apps for iOS and Android, so you can use the website or have Auto Tempest right on your home screen with your uh, personal device there. Auto Tempest has all the cars with one search. Head over to autotempest.com slash tire right now so they know that we sent you. That's autotempest.com slash tire and start searching for your next car in one search. Now... Back to the show. Can you can you do anything? The, just see, just find out which shop really wants to shoot for the stars. Should I try? I could get appraised by CarMax, like just as is. If <laughs> got a thing, you flip Ooh. this. Yeah, give me the VIN doc. I could put it in. Give me the VIN dot com. That'd be funny. Any, any car, any condition. Yeah, <laughs> it's in pieces. The body's not even rolling. Yeah, uh, <laughs> some assembly required. Oh man, we'll get it. I'll get it figured out at some point. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the very last thing on my list, I feel like we should talk 
about the Chrysler Pacifica. Mm. We rented a Chrysler Pacifica for this trip, and it had very low miles, 2,100 miles, which mm. for, for Enterprise, that's that's pretty low. And uh, I got to say, initial quality, pretty good. Very. It's a nice van. Absolutely. It's like- When's the last time you were in one of these? Uh, it's been a minute. Uh, it's been it's been a while. I don't rec- I don't. It's probably two years since I've been in a Pacifica. I mean, I, we use these a lot when we film Proving Grounds. But I remember I remember when we got the new one, the new Pacifica versus the Chrysler Town and Country, and I was like, "Ooh, this yeah. is nice. Like the, the gauges were nicer. It has an all new interior. Mm-hmm. Captain's chairs are more comfortable. This is a great minivan. Yeah, and this one's got the smallest wheels. I think they're either 17s or 18s. Mm-hmm. So it's got like some sidewall on it and. And here on the the island where we are, there's actually a lot of dirt dirt roads and gravel roads, and so the sidewall is like much appreciated. Um, the back seats are nice. We flip yeah. them up and down a whole bunch. This is a pretty sweet sweet van. Car plays great. Uh, lots of storage, lots of cup holders. It's got heated seats, radar cruise. Yeah, uh, I've sat in the third row a number of times and had enough leg room for like a twenty five minute drive. Yeah, and I think and you can move the middle row up if if the people in front. Yeah, it want slides to it. right. Yeah. Power doors, <laughs> not bad. Minivans are awesome. Yeah, like they, if you really, they are. Yeah, they used it to be drives. Shitty. It drives nice. Like we don't, you know, I'm not like whipping it around, but like the the roads here on this island are quite twisty, low speed, but still twisty, and it's like pretty maneuverable. Uh, it's nice. Mm-hmm. I really like it. I'm I have no idea what this costs. I'm guessing this is like probably like fifty sixty. You think it's that much? I For the so. non-hybrid, what is it? What does a Pacifica start at these days? Because this one has like leather and radar cruise and stuff, but I don't think it's the upper trim. I would say high high forties. Ooh, it depends. And if it's, is it all wheel drive? Do you know? No, not all wheel drive. Uh, okay. I have done some FWD burnouts. Well, they it. they start at forty. Okay, so I think this is probably mid mid forties. 46, 47, right. if I had to guess. Yeah, that's not bad. I wouldn't that's I wouldn't get the hybrid. Yeah. I don't have Stellantis's hybrid sh- stuff is not really by the way, how many how many th- cars does Chrysler make right now? This? Oh yeah, it's only it's this and the three hundred. That's it. They're down to two cars. Yeah. And the three hundred's like about to die, yeah. right? They have the Pacifica, the Pacifica hybrid, yeah. you want to count that. And then they have the Chrysler three hundred. Yeah. And that's which we know is ending. How long until this becomes a Dodge Caravan? Ooh. Right? That's a good question. I mean, wh- why why, are we why keep Chrysler, Chrysler alive when you, I mean, you, you're not going to call it a Ram because the Ram vans are different. They're yeah, like yeah. commercial sprinter kind of copies. But you've got that Caravan. You could, people remember a Dodge Caravan. Uh, yeah. Because Chrysler Town Country was the first one. No, the Caravan a, and the Voyager were first. They were first? Yeah, then the Chrysler Town and Country was the upscaled version of those. Then that's all the marketing team needs. You, yeah. need, you need the history you attach it to. And in, in fairness, like, I'm not trying to be I, a little bit of a dick, but it's the origin story. Like, this is where all minivans began. Mm-hmm. So why not, you know, name it back to its roots? I, I'm just saying, if they're, yeah. if they're down right. to this. Do they have any concepts? Um, a minivan concept? No, no, no. Like, have they had any concept cars in the last few years? Oh, they did. No, they. I think they oh, did. Oh, the Halcyon. The Halcyon thing, cool. right? Yeah. yeah. Which is like, we'll see. But you that know, doesn't look. Are they going to make that before anything no. else? Like, they need volume sellers. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. What's going to happen to that brand? Yeah, Chrysler brand. Because this is pr- this product. I mean, I guess good. the only saving grace is that almost there's got to be like no standalone Chrysler dealers, right? They're also they're all like Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, Dodge. Probably. Right? Yeah. So they probably just fold that in. You know, like there were no standalone Pontiac dealers. They were all like Pontiac, GMC, Buick, right. and Cadillac. They send you the sign to put on the roof. Yeah. And then they send you the cars. Right. Yeah. But I I mean, I, and again, I don't I don't know. Not again. I don't know how this thing holds up to 50, 60,000 miles. It might completely fall apart. It might have warranty claims up the ass. I have no idea. But I'm saying to get in it and drive it. It feels nice, mm-hmm. and it drives pretty nice. Although, when we had six people in it and a bunch of luggage, the rear suspension was like a little bouncy. Yeah. I don't know if they have an upgraded suspension, but that might be nice. They need the uh, adjustable compression rebound. Some old Some RS stuff. Yeah. 
There's been the Honda the Honda team. They race they race Odyssey. They did, so, yeah. And caged the thing. Um so but in general, uh no, it was lap. one lap. Yeah. It was the one lap van. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was, it was not slow. They blew mad gearboxes though. It was like they put a lot of power to this thing. They kept blowing gearboxes. Um so anyway, that's the uh that's the end of my list. Uh, I do want to plug that starting um, next week, ammo products, Larry Casilla's uh, ammo products, will be available at West Side Collector Car Storage locations. It is going to be the first uh, place in America and the only place in America where you can buy them in person. You can buy them off his website, but if you're in Los Angeles, you'll be able to buy them from us at WCCS um, Playa Vista and WCCS Gardena and uh you know you don't have to pay for shipping or anything so we'll have uh almost everything he sells on his website um in stock and so you can come in and nice and buy them you don't need an appointment you can you can just walk in uh during business hours and he'll probably have an announcement about that too but i just thought i'd put that out there um let's get to the patreon of course if you want to ask questions of our uh from us for the ask questions on the show uh if you want an ad free listening experience if you want to get extra show every month and if you want um early access to our merch drops and a whole lot more patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast is where you do it remember to get that merch at uh the smoking tire shop or at uh the smoking tire.com slash uh, not slash the smoking click tire.com the and link. click click the merch link right uh, all right, let's see what we have here. Uh, Ryan West says, is a 50K-ish mile Focus RS at 25 to 28,000 a better value than a new or lightly used Corolla at 42,000? Uh, this would be used for uh, commuting, mostly weekends and track days, but I have a hard time feeling good about spending 42,000 plus tax on a car. Could afford it, but not sure if I want to. First off, let me just say that I sold my Focus RS for $26,000 with 16,000 miles on it. And if wow. these cars are now the same exact price with 50,000 miles on it, I got hosed. Well, it's, not, it's not the times. You sold yeah. yours a long time ago. Yeah. Pre-COVID, right? 2018. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mine was a 2016 I sold in 2018. Yeah. Um... So they've held. Forgetting the price, I would much rather drive a GR Corolla than a Focus RS. Uh, the GR rides better. Yeah. It's just more refined ride, slightly softer. Seats are a little bit better, mm -hmm. depending on how, you, how you're shaped and whatnot. But my, my concern with the GR, though, is there's been reports that the rear diffs overheat at track use after like three, four laps. I don't know if that's happened with the Focus RS. I never drove it on the track. Uh, so that's something like if this person, Ryan, you specifically said, you know, you might be doing track days with it. You should look into that for either car because both yeah. of these cars are front wheel drive, you know, basically Duroc or Haldex style with, with Haldex yeah. things. So make sure they're not overdriving that rear differential and that it could uh, fuck things up for you. Yeah. Um, you also, you know, you're not going to have a warranty of any kind on the Focus RS. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if. Parts were expensive for a Focus RS. I mean, you could I, probably get the ride close to the GR with aftermarket suspension, but now you're mm -hmm. like, let's say you spend four grand on suspension. I mean, now you're, I mean, I bought the you know, best suspension two. you could get for that car, the KW oh, yeah. DDC, and it only improved it a little bit. I mean, it made it better. Was the spring rate different? Yeah, it was the whole thing. Yeah, right? it was a coilover. It's the whole thing. But, and I downsized the wheels. I minus one the wheels. I went from 19s to 18s. And I only got it a little better. It wasn't that much better. Um, I mean, I, I do think the GR Corolla will hold its value better than other cars. I think it will have good residual values, especially the longer you hold on to it. Um, and, I mean, I do think a Focus RS will have a floor. You know, a clean Focus RS will always be you know, 20 grand. But now, but if he buys one with 55,000 miles on yeah. it and he owns it for a while and then all of a sudden it's got 60, you know, near and 70. Yeah. Like that, that will be, I think you'll lose a lot more money. Yeah. I'd rather just be, just straight driving, forget the money. I'd much rather be driving the, the 
Corolla. Uh, I would too. I was really s- disappointed with how the RS rode in uh, Malibu. Yeah. I reviewed one like three months ago and it was very poked. It's bouncy. Stick. My it's head bouncy. Was, yeah, it's really bouncy. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd probably I'd probably go with the Corolla even even with the fifteen to twenty thousand uh, dollar tax. Um, I know it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but you get a warranty. You get a car that drives better. You're going to get a good warranty. If you keep it stock, you'll be able to beat on it. Yeah, you know, and, you might not lose as much money. When you and I think it. the diffs are better too. I mean, I don't know about this the thing that overheating on the track that didn't happen to me. I wasn't running half hour sessions. We were running five, six laps at a time, but that didn't happen to me. And, you know, it wasn't our experience. Mm-hmm. Um, my experience, you can romp on that thing pretty hard. It didn't happen when we had performance car of the year Ooh. either. And I mean, I mean, I, who's to say, did Toyota juice the car? Like maybe, I don't know, but, but we had 10 guys running through that car on a track and that it never happened. So, Good point. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but assuming you could afford it, which Ryan says he can, I'd rather have the Corolla. Mm-hmm. And I think it'll depreciate more than the Focus RS will, but then you also have a warranty and you also have what is, in my opinion, a nicer driving experience. Why not get like a Civic Type R or a even like an Elantra Type like N? The other, the other one is Elantra N. Yeah. Elantra N is almost as fun as the GR Corolla, a few thousand dollars less, but it might depreciate more. It probably will, but it's like 10 grand less. Yeah. Um, I think the Civic would hold its value better. It's also more like 45 grand for mm-hmm. that car. If but, you can get one, it's sticker. Which yeah. I don't know if you can. Uh, Peter says, uh, how do the Atlanta and LA Porsche Experience Centers compare is one better than the other or are they both equally as good have you driven it Atlanta one i have not i i never that. have i've seen it yeah uh, um guys got to take one more quick break for factor time to eat stress-free this spring with factors delicious ready to eat meals i'm down here in south carolina eating like garbage and i can't wait to get home and get back on track with some factor Every factor, never frozen meal is chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. You can choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, that's me, or Vegan and Veggie, plus more than 60 add ons every week like breakfast, on the go lunch, snacks, beverages, and more. Get started today and fuel up for your springtime goals. Man, uh, it's we're getting awful close to like summer beach season right now. I was on such a good track for like a year. I feel like in the last month I lost it because I've been traveling so much, and uh, and I have such a busy schedule between the travel, the shooting, the recording, uh, the running, the business. I need Factor waiting for me when I get back to LA to eliminate the hassle of prepping, cooking, cleaning up, and rushing to eat unhealthy foods. There's premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini, and asparagus in their gourmet section. And uh, look out for the Earth Month Eats badge on the menu for Factor's lowest carbon footprint meals for Earth Day. Head over to factormeals.com slash tire50. That's factormeals.com slash tire50. And then use code tire50, tire50. To get 50% off your first month plus 20% off your next month. That's code TIRE50 at factormeals.com slash TIRE50 to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next box while your script subscription is active at Factor. And now, back to the show. I mean, I wouldn't fly, you know, like... I wouldn't leave LA. I wouldn't to go leave to it. <laughs> yeah, or vice versa. Right. I think they're they they're both like the modules and stuff are the same. The wet skid pad is the same. That kick plate thing is the same. They've got an acceleration run. It's the same. The shape of the road courses are not exactly the same, but they're pretty similar. They're similar enough as to like it doesn't make that much of a difference. Mm-hmm. I, I would go to whichever one is more convenient for you. I I don't. Cars are the same. The instructors. I, I mean, 
they're designed to be the same, basically. The road courses are slightly different, but they're the same as, uh, uh, you know. And I think both instances, the building, the facility is really nice. They have historic cars on site that you can look at. Like, they provide a near identical experience. Mm hmm. Uh, oh, Justin wants to talk about the, the engine swaps we talked about last week. Um, I suggested doing a BMW K1600 and a cappuccino. And uh, he says that there are people doing a Hayabusa swap kit for the Miata. There's, yeah. um, we know some folks here in L.A. who have a turbo Hayabusa motor in their Miata. I want to drive that thing. It's apparently batshit. Holy Yeah, baby. it is apparently batshit. Um, there's, and there's more questions on Patreon. Right? Okay. Uh, Daniel says, have you seen the new Ozarks International Raceway? It is a four mile long road course in Missouri. Uh, I haven't. Will you will you look that up? Let's take a let's take a look at some Google images of it. Let's see. Oh wow, look at that. Well the the uh elevation Whoa. map looks very nice. Reminds me a bit of Monticello. Whoa. Oh that looks beautiful. Look at that. That is a nice hill. That it's got like it's America got sort of a Road America, a Watkins Glen kind of vibe to it. Too bad it's in fucking Missouri. It's far away. That's far. It's an inconvenient place to go. Um, but it does look uh, quite pretty. Let's see, gallery. Let's see the gallery. What are the what are the photos looking like here? Well, if you happen to be in Missouri, I would say this is probably worth checking out. It's uh, it's got it does have a lot of elevation changes. That's that is for sure. Um, yeah, it looks nice. It does yeah. look nice. I would need I would need someone to uh, fly us out there and give us something to drive. That's legit. Yeah, looks nice. All right. Dustin says, help me settle a bet. My father has a 2011 GT500 Shelby with the original tires on the car. Yikes. Big yikes. Says it's never driven. In an online auction setting, is the car worth more because the original tires are still on it? No, it is not. Um, there are people who think that this is true. And if you are like... If you're talking about a car that's like the tires aren't made anymore. I think that's when it's, you know, I mean if it's like 30 something. Yeah, I mean if it's like literally I I I've seen stuff where it's like 67 tri-power Corvette 80 miles, you know, original tires on it. Like maybe. But like I I don't think if it's a modern car where tires are easily available, I I I don't think so. I certainly don't think if the tires are on it. I think if you really care, I encourage everyone who really cares about this, take the tires off, the original tires, keep them in a fucking bag on the side, and if you go to sell the car, hey, it comes with the original tires. They're not on the car. The original tires don't do you any good on the car mm. at all. I mean, even if the car is really old, I mean, it's shady to drive around. It's dangerous. You know, if the car's really old, fucking put put the tires in a bag and sell them with the i wonder if it was like a brass era car that you know you're not going to drive and you're like these are original because it's going to sit in a museum or in your house but i just I, i've never heard of any collector or appraiser saying that a car is worth more because of the tires i've definitely heard that a car is worth less because the tires are out of date and need to be replaced. Then you go, oh, well, now I'm going to spend four grand on yeah. tires. Yeah. If I buy this, I'm going to want to drive it. Shelby's are really interesting because people buy them to fucking park them, which is a shame. So many Shelby's sit parked. And they made a lot of them. Yeah. That's but you never thing. see them. Yeah. GT500s, like 2010 to 12s, like or 2010 to 14s, like you don't see them. People bought them and just parked them. And so there's a lot of GT500s with very, very low miles on them. But uh, it, I think in a semi-modern or modern car, the car is worth less with the original tires because the new, but the next buyer is going to want to put tires on them. We went to the Shelby Museum in Vegas, which is cool because it's free. And there's like 20 cars there, and it's everything in the lineage, basically, other than the Omni. But the two things I would say, if anyone there is listening... They don't have any placards near any of the cars telling you what they are or their history. Mm. And I think it's because they sell a guided tour, which seems a bit, is a bit expensive per person given how small that space is. 
just something that tells me what this Mustang is and when it was from and why they, why they chose this one, not other ones. Uh, and then the amount of merch that Shelby's name is on is incredible. Oh, like, yeah. It is larger than I thought. It's like Harley Davidson. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's every kind of shirt. There's camo Shelby. Merchandise. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. Shelby the toilet paper. They had Shelby <laughs> coffee, which, you know, was probably, yeah. <laughs> probably bagged years ago. Let me tell you something, though. You know what I fuck with? Carol Shelby chili spices. I buy them at the grocery store. Buy them at Ralph. You've been making chili I for buy like them at Ralph. 50 years. Carol Shelby's chili spices are really, really good. I, I make chili with Carol Shelby's. That's awesome. I actively choose it. It's fucking good. So I, I would recommend that's the merch you buy is some Carol Shelby chili. Oh, so last last um, mm-hmm. last show we talked about memory seats and uh, Ryan. You're not the only person to say this, Ryan. Someone else said, and it is in fact all VAG products. The memory seats are one tap uh, if the door is open Mm. or hold it down if the door is closed. Uh. And I have figured out why this is. It's probably because there isn't a sensor in the seat that prevents you from being crushed. So if the door is open, they assume you're not in the car or could get out. So if you tap it and the seat moves up, you don't get crushed. But if the door is closed... They need you to hold it because you could potentially like crush your knees into the dashboard. Like if you're, yeah, if you're seven feet tall yeah. and you get in and hit the button for your wife or whatever, and it just keeps going and going and going. Oh, yeah, panic situation. That's pretty smart. Right, I thought that through. Right, right. That's funny. and I like that it's one tap if the door is open because presumably it's on the door, or the side of the seat, somewhere easy. So if the valet has moved your seat, you then tap it to move. And you before, stand there. Yeah, yeah, and it does it before you get in the car. Yeah. So there we go. Oh boy, can we uh, zoom in? I can't read that. Read that shit. Can't read it. There we go. Okay. All right. <clears throat> oh, Justin Gerard wants to s- discuss the Tycon's brakes and why they are inconsistent, as per my comments. All right. We'll take. Let's. I mean, I'm not. I'm just saying. This is. This is a. This is a. All right. Here we go. There are two brake master cylinders, one for the real brakes and one for the regen feedback. Every time you press the brakes, the computer calculates a target, in quotes, Porsche's wording, which aligns the brake feedback with the brake pressure and the point at which your foot starts to feel that resistance. So the feedback about the brakes being inconsistent is definitely rooted in reality. It is not consistent on purpose. Separately, there's a failure that can occur where the computer misses a target and your foot goes straight to the floor. It's a bit terrifying. People who daily these cars know about it, and uh, Porsche has made attempts to fix it via software. Attached is the TSB from Porsche, which has a lot of detail and put the uh, the, the TSB in there. Um, so, I mean, yes, that that so what you're saying there, I think, is is pretty accurate. Um, the and it sort of lines up with what I described. As you press the brake, the first thing you get is the regen. The second thing you get is the caliper. And depending on how hard you hit the brake, if you don't hit the brakes very hard, you only get regen. If you hit the brakes really hard, like a racing driver, it goes straight to caliper. If you hit the brakes medium, then it plays around somewhere in the middle which creates an ins- inconsistent pedal feel. In other cars, such as the Hyundai Ioniq 5N and other cars that have a, quote, one-pedal drive system, simply lifting off the accelerator activates the regen, and then when you hit the brakes at a medium-high force, it goes to the caliper. So it's more consistent. When you hit the brakes from medium-high speed d- directly, is it not using any regen? It's going straight to caliper? It's like in, said, in the Ionic 5N. Right. Um, when you have the regen turned up, such as in manual mode or in pedal mode, it gives you almost full regen when you just lift off the accelerator pedal. So by the time you hit the brake, it's really all caliper, which gives you a more consistent brake feel. But what if you went, if you were, you know, driving with two feet and you went when from full throttle to full brake? Right. Is it jump? Is it going past regen and using caliper only? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or what it's or I should say it's not it's using both but it's not blending them both in the pedal. Mm-hmm. 
the regen might be happening, but it, it doesn't change got it, with got it, got pedal it. pressure. Right. You know what I mean? So the Tycon, because it's set to coast and not to regen until you hit the pedal, the regen has to be activated by the pedal. Yeah. It's not activated by lifting off the accelerator. And the master, the second master cylinder provides the feedback on the right. brake pedal. Right. Interesting. So it's... It's it's fine when you're just light pedal, and it's fine when you slam the pedal, but anything in between gives you an inconsistent feedback through that, that pedal. handoff from, Correct. call it Master Cylinder 1 to Master Cylinder right. 2. Yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ivan says, is there a better taste of American V8 than the C6 Z06? Uh, I'm looking to experience it, and it seems like the clear choice under 45000 I mean, sure, there is. It just depends on your budget and whatever. Of course. Cobra, side pipes. Oh, God, yeah. You know, I mean, or like Ford GT, you know, one of the best V8s ever put into a into a car. Or if you can get a, I don't know, what's a used Mach 1 cost? That's just a great yeah. Mustang. Sounds good. Sounds like a Mustang. Yeah. I would or rather the have... 2021, 2022 Mach exactly. 1. Yeah. I would rather have a Z6, C6 Grand Sport than a Z06. Or a, or a, I mean, or a GT three fifty R. Oh, you know that's 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 a fucking. I mean, I I know that engine has its problems, but that's a that's a motherfucker. Didn't they offer I, extended warranty on those cars? Like, believe so. Who cares that? Um, I mean, a C six Z six is great. It it is great. It, the interior will feel like garbage, but especially now that it's t- almost twenty years old. Yeah, it's gonna be rough in there. And they have the uh, cooling issues. Yeah. Well, oh uh, that that's a C seven. C six is the four twenty seven. Oh that's right, yeah, 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 that's right. Um, I mean, it's a, they're a great car. C six Z six, that's a great car. Um, but if if what you're looking for is best possible V eight, you know, it's very you, subjective. You got two Mustangs. You know, you've got you could get that. You could get that in a, in a fifth gen Camaro Z twenty eight in for forty five grand. That's I might rather awesome. have that than a Z six. Ooh, you know, because you're talking twenty fifteen now. 2013, 2015. The interior is newer on the Z28, isn't mm-hmm. it? Right? Because that car, the generation of that car is still yeah. newer. Oh, but you can't see out of them. That's yeah. a great car. It is a great car. A lot of good options. Yeah, I mean, talking about American v you got your LS3, your LS7, or your your Ford Voodoo. modular motor, the, either the Voodoo or the, the, the next-gen Coyote motors. Mm-hmm. Those, are, those are pretty much where it's at. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Mama my Miata. Uh, could you comment on whether or not the facelift fixes uh, the facelift of the Elantra N fixes a lot of the current gen's unfortunate design features? Highly subjective. Yeah. Does it to, does it look a little better to me? Yes. But could you just pull up a photo of it on the internet and see what it does? Like, yes, I would say the photos of it are accurately represent what it looks like in real life. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't mean like a cop out, but like, can I, I can't decide if it fixes it for you. If you, you look at a photo of it now and like, that's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not like the photos are lying to you. That's what it looks like. So if you, if you like how it looks now, or at least don't hate it, it's a great, great performance product. Uh, they're fun as shit to drive. Absolutely. And they're basically as fast as Civic Type R's for ten to $15,000 less. Yeah. Um, Mr. Nailhead says, what is the ugliest or most unpleasant car in the modern era that you can see increasing in value long-term? Ugliest or most unpleasant? Well, I think we have to think like, like Aztec is ugly, but they made a lot of them. I mean, the Hummer H1 is deeply unpleasant and they are there. They will be worth money. Yeah. They're holding their value. Yeah. I don't know if they're going up. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, Ferrari six twelves, and mm-hmm. yeah, I find that car very unattractive. I know that yeah. that's a subjective thing, yeah. But people, it's not people unpleasant, them, but it doesn't look great. I just think it looks weird. Yeah, they drive nice though. That's what I've heard. You know, trying to be twelve. Um, ugliest or most unpleasant car. Um. I mean, 
Okay. Uh, I I think it is possible that Range Rover Evoke convertibles could be collectible long term. It seems like the people who have them love them. And just like the Subaru Baja yeah. and stuff like yeah, that, like the if there's enough people, doesn't take that many, that really love those things, they could become uh, collectible. Uh, yeah. um, they, they didn't, I don't think they made a lot. Is, it, is there production numbers on the Wikipedia? Uh, hard stop. That's not helpful. The convertible. Here we go. Does it say production? I don't know. I don't know. There's not a lot. That's a good though. point, though. That's a good wild you know, card. I like that. Like those those convertible, I mean, possibly even Murano convertibles. Like they're junk, but. Yeah. Uh, shout out. Savage Geese did a really funny video about the Murano. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really they did, yeah. Uh, Levy Sinclair. Oh. Oh, Han- yeah, Hannah wants to, Levy wants to hear about Hannah's fucking experience at Twitter. We we can't talk about that yet. Um, she's part of the class action suit. Once that gets settled, yeah. then you can't, you know, we don't want don't to burn that one before <laughs> the money could come out of it. Um, Richard James, uh, how do you feel about the crop of used higher end performance EVs that have now depreciated like a brick? Are used EV buys something you feel comfortable with or do you have some hesitancy even in low mileage examples. Um, I I don't want a used EV. I consider an EV a disposable car, which is not good for the environment. It's not good for any, but I want full warranty. I don't want to own an electric car for one minute out of warranty. Mm -hmm. So if you can get a, you know, a fucking, the the example used, I found of a 45K e-tron GT. If you could find that with a, with, Eight years left on the warranty. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Because Richard said he bought an Ionic Five, but it's not that fun. Totally true. Good car, good daily. So yeah, you could probably you can find a used performance EV, which is depreciated yeah. so much. And by the way, also won't be that fun. It, it Perform be, most performance EVs are not that fun. But I think if you got something like a Taycan, you know, that's slightly more fun. Right, it, it is more fun. The handling, there's more. The handling more fun. The interior is more fun. Like all of it is a better driving experience slightly than the Ionic 5, which is like a soft riding crossover that, you know, is okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, without a warranty, who, like, and we also don't know where the floor is on these things. Yeah, the, the floor is zero. I mean, they're literal. The I think it's about zero. zero, but I, I think it, it's going to keep falling from where it is. Yeah, they don't, they don't, I don't think these cars have a floor. We just don't know yet. I mean, it, it's, cause, because at a certain mm-hmm. point, the the cost at a certain point, whether that's in ten years or fifteen years or twenty years, the battery will be donezo, mm. and the cost to replace the battery will not be worthwhile. And when there's, I don't see any nostalgia for the car that makes it worth saving. No, I think then you'll have a secondary market that will replace the battery for seven thousand dollars, and then we go, well, how much is this? 15 year old e-tron with yeah. an aftermarket battery worth so is that going to be the new busted camry people buy to drive to work is that the crown vic replacement you know people are yeah. low money and they want to just get a car they go hey here's this used ev that's a frankenstein yeah. I don't know, at a certain know. point i think that math stops working and that car becomes worth zero mm. um and even if it's the problem is that that ha- that'll happen even to an enthusiast car oh like for sure icon. now it'll it'll get pushed out of the enthusiast community yeah. long before that yeah so um yeah um i so i mean i i it, it to me it's all about the warranty i would not want an ev without a bumper to bumper warranty yeah i just wouldn't so if you can get a nice ev for 50 percent off msrp or whatever but it's still got a ton of warranty left okay cool you know but that just because it's already depreciated by 50 percent doesn't mean it won't depreciate by all of that again yes because it will um cory what state has the best mexican food california no no question other states have good mexican food but on 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 average california 
I mean, I agree. I'm biased, but it's Close. definitely better than Texas, and it's definitely better than Colorado, which they mentioned. And it's better than both Arizona and New Mexico, which are the other states that fucking touch Mexico. So, like... Probably because we grow a lot more of the produce here also, so the ingredients are better, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we, we give a fuck here. Uh, Miguel Flores, thoughts on the E92 uh, BMW 335D. I don't know anything about them long term, but I remember being surprised at how quick they were when they were new. Yeah, and I know you can tune them and make all the torque in the world. Yeah, and you can do suspension. I mean, the same kind of suspension shit you could do to any other E90 car you could do to those. You know, they're only automatic, mm-hmm. um, but they, they're they fast. Like, they, they they run really good. So I don't, I don't know about them long term, dependability, any of that kind of stuff. But at the time, they were pretty rad. Yeah, I like the formula. Yeah. I, the idea was good. Uh, George Sherman says, um, would you ever think the gamification of EVs could be something consumers could get behind uh, through driving or attending certain events? Owners could get achievements that could unlock certain rewards. Example, oh, wow. drive a thousand miles in your car and you unlock the Voodoo V8 sound and powertrain pack. That's a really interesting question because that is Pokemon meets video games that's right interesting but but is the point do we really want incentives and i'm gonna put on my environmental hat here do we want incentives for people to drive more than they need to drive to get something as opposed to what the oems really want which is for you to spend money well, right, but if you're spending money, like I could see that being um, promoted by Shell EV chargers. Right. You know, go to 15 gas stations and you'll unlock this sound because they're because they will benefit from you traveling, using up juice, and then buying a charge somewhere. Your EV Go or something like that. But I think you make a great point that it would be it would be interesting for an OEM to promote it because it encourages you to consume and use the energy. That's what I'm saying. Right. I, I, no, no, I'm agreeing with that yeah, point. Yeah, but but I, I like the idea. I think it's an interesting idea, and I think it's the kind of thing that if you sat down with a marketing agency, they'd probably go, ooh, you know, and and and. But another thing about it is, those incentives work well in video mm-hmm. video games because you you sit in the same place, you have time, and it's also aimed at younger people. Yeah, who have lots of time to burn, right? Pokemon, all that stuff. But this, you're asking adults who can afford a Maki to you know use their time to go drive these things maybe if if it was a partnership with like national parks and they go hey if you're a family if you go to four right. national parks in a year you get something right but i th- i don't think you'd get a bunch of adults who can afford to buy a maki to just go to these different waypoints to unlock a sound yeah so that's a pretty interesting idea as a consumer i wouldn't want to i wouldn't do it now it doesn't mean it's a bad idea because there's a lot of things that make a lot of money that i don't do but like, if if I had the choice of spending two hundred dollars or having to drive a thousand miles to get this thing, if I wanted it, I'd just spend the two hundred dollars. Right. Um. But I do think the idea of um, what are they? Is it uh, was it geocaching? Yep. You know, uh, doing a sort of a geocache type of game with cars given how accurate GPS technology is, could be fun. And you could tie it into the public charging network, whereas if they wanted to do it, if you were on the mission, let's say, you signed up for the game, and all public charging was free while you were playing the game, you know, Mm -hmm. to try and get people to... That's a great way to promote your charging network. Right, like I would, if I had a charging network, I would give people a free charge to review my charger, you know, to like write a review of it or, or, or whatever. Like I, I would gamify it that way to try to get people who were otherwise hesitant about public charging to use public charging and get more comfortable with it. But I wouldn't necessarily want to I keep getting hung up on the thousand miles thing. I wouldn't want to incentivize, incentivize extra driving that doesn't need to be done because at all extra driving is and from an environmental perspective bad right tire particles and traffic and congestion and blah 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 yeah you know 
but but it, the company promoting it may not care. Like sure, you know, McDonald's says, "Hey, collect all these Monopoly pieces by eating hamburgers, and you might win." Blah blah blah. Yeah, sure. But so. the question, the, but George's question is, would the gamification be something consumers get behind? Ah, true. So I think it'd be tough. I think it would be tough. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think consumers are busy. <laughs> I think at that price point, consumers are busy. I yeah. think young the younger people could do it, but they're not going to have the vehicle. So yeah. it may. So again, it may work to go back, like for EV Go, but and let's say ten years in the future when uh, what's his name's you know Etron has depreciated to six grand. Yeah, and now seventeen year old Jim or you know Shelly can get one. They might be down to do this Easter egg hunt, scavenger yeah. hunt because they have the time after school and you know it's incentivized by EV Go. You know what I do like? I like that if you buy a high performance EV, you go to the driving school like Ford offers with Mustangs and Focus RSs and stuff like that. You go to that and you get a QR code that gets you the sound pack. That's a good idea. I like that, where you're the improving of your driving skills through training gets you stuff. That I do like. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, I'm into that. Um, last one, Joe says, uh, did you see the story on the C63 wagon saved from the crusher in Chicago? I did see this. I saw the headline. Let me just say that. I didn't read the story because it was uh, it was someone illegally imported a Mercedes C63 wagon. Um, I, I don't know. Why was it saved? Why did they? Why? I mean, in theory, it shouldn't really need to be saved because it was it shouldn't need to be destroyed because it it had the same emissions inspection, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see. Keep going. Keep going down. Why does the story say it was saved? Uh, ended up in the junkyard, um, blah, 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 loopholes, takes time. They applied for a junk... Oh, okay, so they... Okay, so they applied for a junk title, which remote which... Okay, so basically, it was saved, but not in a way that's good for any of us. So it, the, it was saved by some a scrapyard. Rather than crushing it, they gave it a junk title which says it can never be driven on the road again, but it could be exported back to Europe. So the EPA gave the owner two choices, get it crushed or ship it to Europe immediately. Owner couldn't afford to spend 10, well, couldn't afford to send the car back to Europe and sell it there. So basically the junkyard delayed that process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the funny thing about this is this isn't like a rare car. These are all over the place in Europe. It's such a cool like, looking car. It's awesome, an awesome car. I'm not like no hate on the yeah, car. Like, it's awesome. But like it's funny that this is like a story because it's not like it's a super rare car. It's just like someone snuck one here and 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 in order to like quote save it, the answer is like send it back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, like it's a pretty it's like it's it's not a super common car, but it's not that special. Well, it's rare here, and it will continue right. to be rare here because this one has to get sent back to Europe. Right. So it can't it can't be uh, mm-hmm. you know it can't be driven on the street. You could turn it into a race car. I mean, you could go full Tom Walkinshaw racing. Cool. I would. That's what I would do if I was stuck with one of these things. I could buy it for cheap. Yeah. I'd fucking gut the thing and make it a, a champ car or something. You know, endurance race car. Probably fucking rad. They would smoke fools. Yeah, touring car. Um, FCP Euro would like love to get their hands on something like that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if it's it's funny that it that it became a story, even though it's like, yeah, they just they just did the thing that they were legally told they could do. It's right. not like it's not like some like heroic thing happened here. The government was like, well, you can give it a junk title or you can export it. And they're like, okay, junk title. And and that's that's the end of the story. I wonder if he, if the uh, previous owner knew he could do that. Yeah, I mean, maybe not. It's, uh, it's but then what is that person going to do with it? You know, they're like, I have this car. It's funny when you drive. have a that. It's funny when you have a car that is illegally imported, uh, because in that story they said he got he got busted trying to get the thing through an emissions inspection, and the and the inspector saw a European VIN number. Like, why did you do that? Like one crime at a time, bro. You were trying to, you tried to, you have this car, you know, is illegal. You're going to try and sneak it through an emissions inspection and think they're not going to look at the VIN. Like some people aren't that smart. Dude, if you're going to do that, if you're going to sneak shadily import a car, 
you you have to go Montana. You have to you have to register it. You have to then shadily register it. You can't just like register it in your state like no one's going to see it. Right, right. Or you got to have a smog person. Yeah. Oh, that hooks you up. Right. You don't care what you're right. doing. Yeah. This person cared. Yeah. You got to have a person that fucking puts the facade on the rollers and gives you the sticker. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't. You can't just be like, no, they're not going to look at the VIN. Like, smog has expired on my car that has no VIN. <laughs> it's not going to Can work. you pass this for me? Yeah. It was not thought through. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do like a C63 wagon. Yeah. That's, God, that's such a good looking that car. That is a nice looking car. And the, even the, the this one was the old generation, the naturally aspirated one, the angular one, which is great. But even the current generation also looks excellent. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our porch show, folks. Remember to uh, grab some merch from the store, uh, thesmogentireshop.com and, uh, and or thesmogentire.com and click on that merch tab. Thank you to our patrons for uh, uh, joining us today and submitting such good questions. we got two more podcasts coming this week. Uh, we've got Mr. Cartoon, uh, legendary tattoo artist and lowrider enthusiast. We're going to talk tattoos and lowriders coming to, coming to the studio on a Wednesday afternoon, Los Angeles time. And then we got Sam from Seen Through Glass, who is a, a great dude. Uh, I, I love spending time with him whenever I'm on, whenever I'm on those European uh, press launches. He is a clutch player. I love that guy. So he's going to be in studio on Thursday. And then we're going to Rhode Island, where we're going to have Wayne Carini on the show on Saturday. And then we're going to have Donald Osborne from the Audrain on Monday, because we're doing the uh, Audrain veteran run, the race in 120-year-old cars. Yeah. It's going to be a good time, but a busy week of podcasting. Somewhere in the middle of there, we will catch up on our pro shows. Uh, our apologies for um, letting that one slip through the cracks. Sorry. Thanks for listening or watching, and uh, we'll see you later. Bye.